At T-Mobile for Business, unconventional thinking means we see things differently so you can focus on what matters most. That's why we've become the leader in 5G, number one in customer satisfaction, and a partner who includes 5G in every plan. So you get it all. Unconventional thinking is better for business. Open Signal Awards T-Mobile as America's fastest 5G network USA. 5G user experience report July 2021. Capable device required. Coverage not available in some areas. Some uses may require certain plan features. See T-Mobile.com. For J.D. Power 2020 award information, visit jdpower.com slash awards. Welcome to the Oh Hell No podcast, where I, Keisha Nicole, delivers a daily dose of passion, purpose, and struggle by interviewing people who are living their best life doing what they love. Here on this podcast, every Oh Hell No moment serves a purpose. Now let's get started with the show. Alright everyone, welcome to another episode of the Oh Hell No podcast. Today we have Iona Holloway. She is an author, a coach, and a speaker. And we are going to talk about overcoming the desire for perfection. Welcome to the podcast, Iona. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure Abs- to be here. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So I want to kind of start from the back and then kind of move forward. Do you know why you um, had this obsession with perfection? I mean, I know that now you're in a better place and, and you've conquered this, but what was the reason why? Oh, it's a great question. And I don't think I have conquered it. Okay. <laughs> I think it's, I, I mean, I think any way that we Perfectionism is a survival mechanism. It's a way to feel safe in the world. And I think it's based on a foundation of fear in many ways. Um, And so I've definitely healed the very painful ways that perfectionism showed up in my life, specifically Mm -hmm. around food in my body and really toxic overworking. But I think that, I don't think perfection is something that you ever truly transcend I think it gets sneakier and a little bit more discreet Uh, but I mean I've spent a lot of time sort of delving into why this became the way that I viewed myself and felt I had to be in the world Um, I think of a lot of it stemmed from growing up as someone who was identified by other people as a high achiever like it was very much reflected to me from a very young age that I was good at things very competent, independent, willful. Oh, she just picks up things so quickly. That was definitely the story that wrapped itself around me. Um, And I became a very, very talented defender of that identity. Um, And I think that being perfect is something that you can kind of get away with until I always say my life peaked at 11. Like from about that age onwards, it started getting very hard to maintain that identity and that ended up being a lot of very invisible silent working very much beginning to push people away so that they couldn't get too close to perhaps Mm. see the imperfections and the cracks Um, and just a lot of internalized fear and aggression which ends up manifesting in a really painful war with food in my body wow okay So I was going to ask you, when did this start for you? But you kind of said from a young age by people kind of saying, oh, you're you're really good. You're really smart, you know, and those things um, sticking with you. Do you think that happened because um, with those compliments, you feel more like loved or more like oh if you know this person is saying this this makes them happy and wanting to stay in that place of pleasing Uh, I think there's definitely an element to that Mm -hmm. um I got a lot of validation um I'll always talk about our worth becoming external like all the ways that I felt I was Iona were in the ways that I was told that I was achieving highly and so it felt like as time went on like school gets harder you start doing more complicated subjects I was a competitive field hockey player I was artistic the story was still I was very naturally talented at this I was very good at this um and that was how I 
was recognized and seen or at least that's what was reflected Mm. back to me um and so that's really what became concrete Um, right so people are saying this but they're not realizing how hard you're working to accomplish all of these things so in your mind you're like oh my God, I got to keep this up because they think that this comes natural. So I don't want to disappoint anyone. Totally. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Oh my gosh. So I know you said a little bit about like the different things that you were doing, but just share with us like how good you were doing. Like in school, were you honor roll, high honors, like feel hockey where you like varsity like just share a little bit about your accomplishments yeah sure um I was so I went to school I was raised in Scotland so it's a wee bit different than like the U.S. education system but I was top of my year in pretty much every subject across the board I got straight A's um I never got a B basically until I was in college um and even then I think it was an A minus um I represented my country in field hockey I was recruited to play division one athletics at Syracuse University I was an all-american there after I graduated one of my first jobs was on contracts at Google um and I then became like a semi-proficient competitive CrossFit athlete could squat on my body weight competed in weightlifting competitions just like across the gamut um a lot of a lot of very visible I call it glitter, like a lot of things that you would say I was collecting all the evidence that I was perfect and Mm -hmm. really making sure that people saw that. Right. Um, Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So what made you realize that this wasn't serving you and that you needed to get help? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Great question. I call this the reckoning. There was one week. Um, it was when I was, I was 29. So it was just over three years ago now, or not quite three years ago. Um, but I had been in a very, very extreme stage of my like dieting story. Like I was the smallest I'd ever been. I'd been using a lot of weightlifting competitions to strip weight, basically to cut weight for competitions under the guise of athletics. But really it was a desire. It was a socially acceptable way to starve. Let's put it that way. Um, and my body was just shutting down. Like it was no longer responding to, to the diets. I could barely stick to them. Um, and I was filled with this, like, it was like primal hunger. Like I could not ever feel full. Um, and one week it was when I was working as a, as a like art director, creative director at an agency at the time. And I took off the whole week, just called in sick. And then we'd go to the gym and exercise for like two or three hours and then come back. And then when my partner left to go to work, I would just binge. I would like, I would go to the shops and just eat until I passed out and then wake up and eat again and then pass out. Talking like up like 10,000 calories, multiple, wow. multiple days in a row. And I just remember at some point it was almost like I kind of rose above. <laughs> I was like just watching myself. I was like, what are you doing? This is, this is insane. Um, And it was around that point where I hate, like I hated myself. I hated everything about myself. It was so, so, so hard to be me, just like excruciatingly hard to be me. Um, None of the glitter was sticking. None of it, none of it was making me feel better at that point. And I talk about this in my book goals. It was like, I really had to get slammed on the floor to pay attention, to be willing to try something different. And that was really the moment for me. It was just like, who are you? I don't even know who you are. Oh my gosh. So at that moment, what did you do to get yourself help? Like, where do you even go? Right. And I think that's the, that's a really challenging thing as well, because I, I knew what I was, wasn't working. I was also, hopelessly devoted to my identity like I loved being the one that was going to the ball and I loved being a CrossFit athlete I loved being the one that everyone was like oh my god there's Iona working so hard um I was like where do I even go to fix this and I had a I had like experiences with traditional therapy and I wasn't ready for them but I also just didn't feel like that was 
what I needed either. Um, so I started looking for slightly more kind of maybe say like alternative or like body based healing stuff, mm-hmm. which is very much along the lines of what I work with my clients through as well, but like meditation, embodiment, breath work, and actually being in a group setting was incredibly healing for me in many ways uh, because something that I think is kind of interesting when you are perhaps someone like me or like I was like very identified with being kind of special like I really did think I was special even though I thought I was also a piece like an absolute disaster Um, I had this feeling that I was somehow better than other people that I was kind of normal things didn't really work for me and being in a group setting with other women really equalized the struggle I was going through because I realized I actually wasn't special in it like one of the most powerful things that my coach said to me she was like Iona you're not that special I was like what do you mean (laughs) because my because my pain felt so personal and it's not that it isn't like everyone's journey is is unique but um my my experience wasn't unique like the lived experience of struggling with perfectionism of going to war with food in my body. I wasn't special in that. And so a group experience for me at that time was actually one financially accessible and two, a real leveling of a shared experience of this kind of struggle with other women. It really allowed me to be seen in a way that I hadn't been ready for before. Wow. That's amazing. (laughs) That, you know, you went through that, you got yourself into this group and you started working on healing and you just realized that, you know, a lot of people are struggling with a lot of different things and, you know, you're just like the rest of us, you know, just trying to figure it out. So you did write this book called Ghost and being someone who wants to be seen in the best light always, what made you feel comfortable about putting all of this into a book? Great question. <laughs> Me, a few years ago, would never have even entertained the idea of, like, Ghost is, Ghost is a very vulnerable, vulnerable book. There are stories in there that are, like, I'm sure some people would say are, like, embarrassing too much, something that they would never feel comfortable sharing. Um I did sufficient work on myself to come to terms with the way that I had perhaps been, the ways that I'd found a way to survive and get through. And so I'm not ashamed of any of it. Um, I'm not ashamed. And this is something I feel really strongly about just giving permission for. Like, we've all done stuff. It's not that we're giving ourselves a pass or... Sometimes like the way that we are interacts with other people and sometimes that is painful on both sides. It wasn't I just kind of gave myself a pass for all that, but I was like, we're going to learn from this. We're going to learn from this so this doesn't happen again or the ways that I treat myself are just no longer acceptable. Like it's no longer acceptable for me to treat myself in horrible ways and understanding that I was a human that was actually worthy of being taken care of not just like a robot that was here to sort of mindlessly execute on tasks it's like I'm gonna learn how to take care of myself now um and that was something that and I think so many strong women that see themselves as strong high achieving um women like learning that kindness and so when I was writing Ghost. I wanted also, I've got this like real distaste for books that are in any way preachy. Like there's enough self-help books out there that are very surface level and it's fine. But I wanted to talk from shared experience and I wanted to show that I've walked through the fire and continue to do so in understanding myself. And so I'm not ashamed of any of the things that I share in the book. I'm proud that I survived them. And Just even an example, like one story that kind of horrifies some people. There's two. There's one where I sort of destroyed my ankle during a hockey match and just like wrapped it up and played on it, even though the ligaments were torn. 
And then there's another story I talk about where I talk about the journey I've been on with my teeth and how I destroyed them over the years just by not taking care of myself and a lot of the shame that I now have in relation to just even like the financial implications of having to fix them. And I can't tell you how many women have messaged me and said, I have the same experience with my teeth or I have played through, walked through, physically injured myself because I couldn't stop. And so these are the reasons why I wrote Ghost, for for women to be seen, for women to be seen. Yeah, and also connecting with people who are having similar experiences and and sharing and helping each other through that journey. Oh, my gosh. Um, So... What would you say are some tips that you want to share with women or even possibly men about maintaining balance professionally and personally? That's a good question. Um, (laughs) I've become a big proponent for making it easy to win for myself. Um, I used to call this, used to talk about this as like an intentional lowering of standards I found that that doesn't really fly. Like that wouldn't have flown with me a few years ago. I'm like, what do you mean lower my standards? I can't do that. I'm perfect. Or like I'm a high <laughs> achiever. Um, so framing it more as how can I actually make this life a little bit easier for me to win at in some way? Um, that's been very, very helpful for me. And then also trying to create in some way a degree of separation between my output and my innate worth and that's like that's a long long road but when you've when you've been a high achieving person who's been validated so consistently for your output for your external stuff your worth displaces it becomes all the things that you are instead of the woman that you are um and so a really really big on supporting folks in learning how to understand their innate worth what that even means that you can be worthy in the moment that you wake up without having done anything um and the the metaphor I often use for this is that of a baby like when a baby's born no one's questioning the validity and worth of the baby it's just it just is it's a human life and if it's crying, you pick it up and you do your absolute best to comfort it and you feed it consistently and you let it sleep as much as it can so that it can grow and then it learns to crawl and walk and then before you know it, it's creating a life. We are that baby. <laughs> Often right. we're like in our 20s, 30s, 40s, relearning that that's the degree of kindness we have to give to ourselves. So whenever I'm having one of those days, I'm like, being really hard on yourself let's pick up baby Iona for a minute and it always grinds me back in reality yeah I love that that's a great analogy so um what are some signs uh that we should look out for that we are in danger of being obsessive about something fatigue any degree or expression of any sort of chronic feelings of of tiredness and that and I'm talking like any kind of physiological, not just like I need to sleep, but like brain feeling slow, soul feeling really sad, um, obviously physical tiredness. I always talk about emotional pain becoming symptomatic, like physical pain of your body, like pain in your mind. None of this is normal. We we are so because it becomes consistent, we get very comfortable being in pain. It's like the horrible thing about all of this. We begin to think that pain is just something that we actually experience and that waking up and not even liking any part of what we see in the mirror is normal. It's not normal. I'm not saying that you wake up every day and love yourself and, oh my God, this is the best day ever. But waking up with that degree of lack of interest in being yourself or lack of hope in what is even going on that's not normal that's not okay we're here for more than that so that's that's definitely the thing that I would say and also if you're like consistently breaking rules 
roles <laughs> that you used to be very adept at keeping. It's a really, really good indication that you're resting on strength and strength is a muscle, willpower is a muscle and it breaks. So if there's any sort of strict regimens or things that you've been previously doing that now feel impossible, it's a really good indication that you're you're at some kind of degree of breaking point or that you're just tired of currently being you. Yeah. Okay. That's good advice. So what was the biggest lesson that you learned from taking control of your life and making the changes that you made? That I'm a woman worth knowing just because of who I am and not because of what I do. Like one of the most exciting feelings that I have is just waking up in the morning and being like, all right, like, here we go. And not having to fight that or immediately think, how do I make this better? Or how do I, how do I win today? (laughs) Or what are the 17 things I have to do in order to be able to eat breakfast? It's like the actual, just being able to wake up fairly neutral about being me is like such a relevant, like such a revelation after so many so many years like decade plus of feeling just like I didn't even know if I could do it I'm amazed I'm still here like that's how that's in, that's how incredible it is um and I'm not saying that everyone has to reach that degree of desperation in order to think that it can be a bit different um but just being able to look in the mirror and be like yeah, I, I like myself. It's like, that never gets tired. Same with just having like so much peace around food and being able to have everything in the house and not caring if I eat all of it, none of it. Like having that degree of peace and trust in myself that I'm just taken care of regardless, that stuff never gets tired. I still sometimes get emotional about it. I'm like, oh my God, there's ice cream in the freezer and I don't care. Like <laughs> that's like... That still to me is just such a, is such a revelation. (laughs) Yeah, that's great. Is there anyone in your life besides your family that went through this experience with you that treated you differently when you were perfect, as opposed to being who you have grown to be today? And are they still around? And is there anyone that never changed the way that they treated you that saw you go through this journey that helped to kind of um, reiterate what you're saying is like, I don't have to do anything amazing to be recognized as an amazing person, you know? Yeah, that's a gr- I love that question. I think there's, <laughs> there's so much fear wrapped up in what if I change? And that was something that I really had to face very honestly with myself because I've been in a relationship for nearly six years now. And my partner and I met in my mid twenties when I was deep in the belly of disorienting, overworking and everything. And when it came to choosing to do this work, I was, I knew that I had to put me first, like regardless of at the expense of nothing. Cause it was that like, it was that important. And I have to say that across the board, I've been nothing but just floored by the degree of support I've received from people who have witnessed the journey. I wasn't like massively public about it, but I did say, this is what I'm doing. And I would like sometimes share with people every month or so, like, this is what I've been working on. I can't tell you like just how much beauty I've witnessed in the support of people who wasn't so much that I thought they were going to judge me, but just that perhaps I would change in a way that they wouldn't be able to relate to anymore. And that's really not been my experience. Um, And I don't try to sort of claim that I am a walking inspiration, but I know that I've given a lot of people in my life a little bit more permission to be open to exploring this work because of of what I went through. Um, And I've even, like, women that I met in my in my 20s who I never even spoke to because I just wasn't available for friendship became clients and I've had these incredible transformations and that feels very special as well um so 
my experience, my fear of that was high. My experience of it was nothing short of beautiful. And I felt also friendships, especially with women transform because for so much of my life, women were competition. There was like a scarcity of resources. I was fighting for the limelight, whether that was in my career or who had the most abs at the gym or like just drink in hindsight oh my god um but that was the reality of it for me and I in witnessing myself being able to be more gentle and kind with myself it's just given me this all it feels like kind of endless capacity to witness other women I never thought I would start a business that was centered on supporting women it's like it's all about me it's all about it's all about me and like my the clients who I have and the organizations that I've worked with to bring this work to people it's like the most incredible part of my life like I'm just so I'm inspired by them and I feel so honored and privileged to do the work with them um so that's been a such an unexpected gift from all of this wow I love that you said that you were women were your competition like you looked at them in a way where it was like okay I have to be better than her I have to be smarter than her I have to whatever because I feel like that's a that's the way a lot of women are like mm-hmm. it's just this automatic they see you they size you up they want to compete with you and I feel like it should be opposite. Like we should be, you know, collaborating and, you know, but you have to do the work to get to a place where you can see that. And that's why I love this story. (laughs) Yeah. And I, just to your point on that, it's like, we were taught poorly. Women have been done done a number on by what's been bled into us by previous generations, the position of women within the society and that lesser than status. Yeah, no wonder we feel like accessories to other people's lives. No wonder we whisper what we think instead of just speak. No wonder we use a million qualifiers when we're stating our needs. This is what we've been taught. We've been taught to be accessories. We've been taught to be beautiful. We've been taught to look a particular way um, and that's just even the experience of women, like never mind minorities or marginalized communities. And like, we need each other. I mean, that's really why so much of like, that was one of the fundamental, most transformational parts of my own was being my own journey was being able to witness other women and seeing them and seeing that our pain was shared, it was collective, it was top down, it wasn't just us, this was fed into us, it's like the water we're drinking, and anything that we can do individually and collectively to reclaim ourselves and each other is so important for us now and future generations, because we're not, we're a ripple, we're a ripple. Love it. (laughs) Absolutely. So um, what has really changed about you now that you live a more balanced life? Like when you look at yourself, besides, you know, the stuff about going and, you know, being able to have the food and whatever, do you still feel like you like to do um, a really good job at things, but now you know that you don't have to go crazy with it? Or like, what would you say changed and what stayed the same, but now you know how to balance yeah I still have very high standards I'm like I love doing a good job I yeah. love creating beautiful experiences I poured my heart into the book hours and hours and hours day after day after day consistently for a year my clients I am there for them 100% within the confines of our contract that's something actually that has been huge for me is the setting of boundaries around my availability and how, like, we all have gifts. I'm not ashamed. I, I've got gifts, absolutely. I'm like creative, great writer, love speaking, love designing. These are my gifts. We all have these, if we can acknowledge them in ourselves. That doesn't mean they just get given away willy-nilly, not resourced. Oh, I don't sleep, actually, so I just force myself to work all the time. No, 
like oh my, one of my favorite um phrases for 2021 is treating myself like a precious object makes me strong so if I'm precious and if I'm strong when I'm treated like I'm precious how do I take care of myself day to day like what does that look like I get enough sleep I eat properly drink water as much as I can when I remember and I'm there for my clients within boundaries and then there's also intentional chosen space for me non-negotiable me time because it needs to like we have to be well resourced we're not robots we're human beings and so as much as we're pouring out and sharing and channeling whatever it is that we want to share with the world we have to be pouring into that cup too and so that's something that I've again imperfect especially as a new business owner or a fairly new business owner it's like yeah I want to grow and do all these things and share all these things like yes and within the limits of your own humanity mm-hmm. so um that's something that I am a big proponent of like trying to view things through the human rather than the robot lens the gray lens rather than the black and white lens anything that reminds us that we have finite energy there's nothing shameful about that on learn to honor it, (laughs) learn to honor it and channel it. Absolutely. So I feel like you are doing purpose driven work, but do you feel like you are doing purpose driven work? And what about the work that you're doing? Do you feel is, you know, a part of your purpose? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I feel very committed to increasing awareness around the experiences of what I would call like high functioning, struggling women, the women who hide in plain sight, the ghost woman that I talk about in my book, um, the strong women that don't get held, the ones that no one worries about because the assumption is they're fine. I feel so committed to shining light on that experience because so many women are cast under that spell and so many women don't feel safe to be held. And something that I feel strongly is that I've been through it, I've lived through it, I can hold space for those women. I know I'm like uniquely qualified to do this. And so that feels very, very important to me. Um, and I also think that I was given a gift I gave myself the gift, but I was also given it by the people that supported me in my journey to get here. I have to pay that forward. We have to pay that forward. Like once we know something that has fundamentally changed the way that we experience the world, once we embody that and it's wisdom and not just like things we've learned, I just think it's our prerogative to share that with with people who it will resonate with. So I deeply believe it's purpose-driven work. But I'm also very open to the way it's shared changing. Like I do a lot of one-on-one coaching at the moment, but a big mission for the next couple of years is doing a lot more group experiences and partnering with organizations and getting these kind of conversations into organizational culture because we can shift a lot individually, but there's a collective societal level element to all of this um so I see it shifting and changing depending on also what I'm excited about doing but I think it's sort of I'm really excited about the mission I think it's so important yes it's very important work so this is the oh hell no podcast so I always ask my guests to share an oh hell no moment that has changed their life change your perspective on something or um, taught them a lesson. So Mm. please share a moment where you thought to yourself, oh, hell no, this can't be happening. And it had some shift um, in your life. Yeah, um, I have had a couple, but I think one I've had was in a group experience that I was in where I felt that um, the experience wasn't one that took into perspective variations of perspectives um there wasn't space for conversation or discussion and it was very much like a top down experience and what I learned from that is we're not here to 
perpetrate more of that dominance and harm over each other, especially as women. Um, it's important to be able to hold other people's experiences, talk about them, share them for people to feel safe to do that, especially if we're talking about allowing strong women to be, feel safe, to be seen in their vulnerability. So I've been in those experiences and I was like, that's a oh, hell no moment. Um, when and if, um, if and when I'm holding those kind of spaces, I want to be as educated and open as possible to hold the diversity of experiences of different women and what those mean. Um, that's important to me. Okay. I love it. All right. So please tell us where we can buy your book, how we can connect with you. And if you have anything that you're doing that that's coming up, please share it with us. Yeah, sure. Um, so you can buy Ghost Why Perfect Women Shrink on Amazon. And if you don't love Amazon, you can Google it. You'll find it elsewhere. Um, and my website's iwannaholloway.com. I have a free gifts section, iwannaholloway.com forward slash gifts. So you can get a free chapter of Ghost there, a reading guide, and some other free webinars that I have. So definitely check that out. Um, and then I'm most active on Instagram and I'm Iona Holloway there as well. So let's find each other there. I'd love that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Iona. What a great interview. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Mobile for Business, unconventional thinking means we see things differently so you can focus on what matters most. That's why we've become the leader in 5G, number one in customer satisfaction, and a partner who includes 5G in every plan so you get it all. Unconventional thinking is better for business. Open Signal Awards T-Mobile as America's fastest 5G network USA. 5G user experience report July 2021. Capable device required. Coverage not available in some areas. Some uses may require certain plan features. See T-Mobile.com. For J.D. Power 2020 award information, visit jdpower.com slash awards. Bubble wrap can keep your television safe, but what's protecting your belongings from phony moving companies? Learn how to keep scammers from bursting your bubble. Go to protectyourmove.gov to research moving companies and to learn more. That's protectyourmove.gov.